what I'm going to do is talk about uh, a few different measures, again, uh, touching on some ideas that have already been discussed um, already uh, by Catherine and Michael. So um, I'm going to talk about some measures of intergenerational relative mobility. I'll talk about one very commonly used measure that hasn't really yet been talked about, which is the intergenerational income elasticity. Then I'll also talk about some rank-based measures that um, have been popularized by the work by Raj Chetty and Nathan Hendren. So I want a quick a plug for Nathan Hendren because people always associate these front page blockbuster mobility studies with, with Raj Chetty, but Nathan is on all of those papers and a very strong contributor to them. Um, I'm Bosch, also thank you for about, correcting me on that. <laughs> I feel badly oh, yeah, that no, I, I no worries. No, omitted you're his name. Just so thank one you. Of many. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll also touch on intergenerational absolute mobility that Michael just talked about, and then briefly discuss intragenerational mobility. And in all cases, I'll kind of quickly talk about what the measures are about and then give you some descriptive findings from some of my own papers. Um, so in terms of the intergenerational elasticity, essentially you could think of that as measuring the statistical association between a child's income and their parents' income. And here we're ideally thinking about lifetime income measured over the entire life cycle. So in that pop-up question, in an ideal world, you might have wanted to measure income over the ages of 25 to 55, something like that. That coefficient between child income and parent income is often called the intergenerational elasticity when the income is measured in logs. And that measures persistence. And we take mobility as one minus that level of persistence. So if you got a coefficient of, say, 0.2, that would say about 20% of the differences in income across families persist to the next generation. And one minus 0.2, or 80%, would dissipate. And so we might think of 0.2 as a measure of pretty rapid mobility. There was a famous presidential address to the American Economic Association by Gary Becker around 1980, where he said, you know, most of the studies find that the intergenerational elasticity is 0.2, and that would suggest that in about three generations, most income differences between families are wiped out. Since that time, researchers have used better and better data and use longer time averages of income to capture more of the life cycle, and have shown progressively higher estimates of persistence and lower estimates of mobility. So for example, uh, some research I did in, for my dissertation showed that the intergenerational elasticity was closer to 0.6. And that suggests that it would take many more than three generations for gaps in um, income to go away. So to give you an idea of uh, what that looks like, in this slide, what I plotted along the x-axis is the income of parents. And on the y-axis is the income of kids. And basically, the slope of that line is telling you what the intergenerational elasticity is. And here what I did was I used a data set where you could compare different cohorts. So these are from the National Longitudinal Studies produced by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The uh, blue dots are for cohorts who were born in the late 1940s and early 1950s who entered the economy uh, who entered the labor market well before 1980, which was when we saw the big rise in income inequality. And the red dots show um, the association in income between parent and kids for cohorts born in the early 1960s who all entered the labor market after 1980. And what you could see is that the slopes of these lines are very different. For people born uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, the intergenerational elasticity 
was around 0.2 and of kind of consistent with the notion Gary Becker talked about of a society where income differences rapidly go away, whereas for the later cohorts, it's closer to the 0.6 I estimated with very long time uh, data from administrative data. Here I'm getting around 0.5, but you could see a very significant increase in persistence and decline in relative mobility. Uh, another way of getting at intergenerational relative mobility is to look at ranks rather than at looking at income or log income. And that really hones in on positional differences rather than income gaps per se. And so this kind of you can think of as being a measure that's exclusive in, of inequality. So it doesn't matter how big income gaps are growing. This is just saying, where are you in the income distribution, regardless of the distance between different ranks or percentiles in the distribution. A nice feature of this is that uh, if you use the national income distribution as a benchmark, a nice way of looking at population subgroups, like looking at differences by race or region. Catherine showed you some, uh, a map based on the uh, Chetty Hendren work where it looked at uh, rank-based differences across the country to show the Southeast had low mobility. What I'm going to show you in this next slide is differences by race. So here what I'm plotting is the rank of parents along the x-axis and the expected ranks of kids along the y-axis. And you could see uh, that at any parent rank in the income distribution, if you look separately for whites, Hispanics, or blacks, uh, where blacks are the red triangles, Hispanics are in blue, and whites are in green, at every parent rank in the income distribution, the expected rank of kids in the next generation is higher. And some of these gaps, particularly between whites and blacks, are quite stark. And you know, in the work Michael did in showing you transition matrices, if you did that separately by race, you would also see really stark differences along, for example, the proportion of people in the bottom quintile staying in the bottom quintile. Uh, those gaps are very large in the order of like 20 to 30 percentage points. Similarly, blacks who start at the top quintile are way more likely to fall out of the top quintile than whites. So now let me turn to intergenerational absolute mobility. And I think that this has gotten a lot of attention and the Chetty Hendren work here has gotten a lot of attention because they're probably the most understandable by the general public if you simply ask, is your income higher than your parents? I think that's a pretty intuitive thing to follow. In my own view, um, I for a long time didn't really think this would be a very interesting statistic, basically because if you imagine a country like the US that since World War II up until, you know, the 70s was growing at 3% a year or more. And if you thought there was fairly stable uh, income distribution, if the entire economy is growing 3% a year and that's roughly equally distributed, you would expect nearly everybody to uh, exceed their parents' uh, income in an absolute sense. But I think what's uh, really what the, the Chetty Hendren work kind of showed is that in an era of rising inequality where that these gains are not equally distributed, you may well see uh, less than 100% of people exceeding their parents and maybe far less than that. And in their work, they showed a major cross-cohort decline that uh, Catherine showed you a figure of earlier. I think one big caveat to that is that they really didn't have intergenerational data for most of the cohorts they were showing. They really only had it for cohorts born in the early 1980s where there's tax data on both generations. Most of the rest of the work is really very indirect and uses a very like technical approach to figuring that out. 
So in a recent paper I did with a co-author, John Davis, at the University of Oregon, we went back to that same national longitudinal survey data that I discussed earlier with relative mobility and also looked at absolute mobility and more directly looked at where we actually had data on parents and kids where the kids were born in the 1940s or 50s versus the 1960s. And this next figure, I apologize, it's not maybe the easiest to follow, but what this shows is the uh, solid blue horizontal line is for the earlier uh, cohorts who were born in the late 40s and early 50s. About 62% of them exceeded their parents' income. And um, if you look at the cohorts born in the early 1960s, um, only about a little more than 50% we find exceeded their parents' income. So we do see a decline, but it's not really a very severe decline um, of the kind you see in the Chetty Hendren work. And the dashed lines, one that's at the top and one that's slowly following, uh, uh, falling down from around 0.8 to uh, a much lower number, are the Chetty Hendren bounds. So essentially, these where they didn't actually have intergenerational data to adjust for that fact they created a set of bounds of what the true answer could be. And you can see that our results fall well within the Chetty Hendren bounds, but fall on the lower end of it. So I think the Chetty Hendren results may have exaggerated the extent to which there was a decline in absolute mobility, but nevertheless, we also see a decline in absolute mobility as well. And as you can see in either of these cohorts, uh, far fewer than 100% um, exceed uh, their parents' income. So I think that's a sobering message given that, you know, with a growing economy absolute and growing absolute income every generation, you might have thought most people would exceed their parents' income. Okay, finally, um, I'm going to talk about intragenerational mobility. And so here, one simple way to think about it would be to think, say, in an absolute sense, how much does your own income grow over the course of your life cycle? So it's measuring the ability to move upward within your own lifetime. In a way, I think this has much more to do with current economic conditions, um, you know, what, how the labor market is doing, for example, or what kinds of economic policies are happening. I mean, case in point is this pandemic crisis where you could imagine right now, um, you know, absolute mobility could, you know, if, if conditions persist for a while, could really shape um, our life cycle for, for, uh, for. Okay, so what I did in looking at intragenerational mobility um, is I looked at uh, individuals' wage growth roughly from their 30s to their 40s and looked at how they differed across states. And I did this as part of a project for uh, Pew when they had an economic mobility uh, project. And so in this next slide, you can see uh, Pew put together a nice sort of interactive website with the results. And kind of the main landing page shows you some of the geographic differences. And so for many of the states, the results were not really highly statistically significantly different from the national average. But what we highlighted here in red were states that had much worse mobility by uh, measures such as wage growth over your own life cycle. And the green were states that had higher than average uh, absolute mobility. So you can kind of see a cluster in the northeast uh, there. So um, basically, uh, you know, I'll wrap up now, um, but uh, hopefully you've gotten an idea of what some different measures of economic mobility show. Um, my view is, is that there really isn't a right measure of economic mobility. There are different measures that ask different conceptual questions, and the appropriate measure depends on the question you're interested in. 
So for example, if you wanted to think about how many generations it takes for a family living in poverty to get to sort of the national average, you might use the intergenerational elasticity. If you wanted to think about, you know, what's the expected, the difference in expected ranks of uh, kids growing up in the Southeast versus the Midwest or Hispanics versus whites, you might want to focus on the rank-rank uh, setting. If you wanted to think about, uh, you know, how likely is it that you're going to exceed your parents' income given all the changes in the um, in inequality in recent years, you might look at that absolute mobility measure. And similarly, if you wanted to see, for example, in a few years from now, how did the COVID crisis impact one's own uh, life cycle growth, you would look at intragenerational mobility measures. Uh, so I've highlighted a few key findings here. Uh, you can read them. I'd say the one point I might emphasize, you know, relative to what Michael said is, you know, he kind of posed this as like you could look at these statistics and say, you know, is this good or is this bad? I would say one other aspect to think about is how we compare it to other countries. And here is where I think, you know, while there's no definitive answer, it's still compared to most other advanced economies, our relative mobility measures are far lower are absolute mobility measures. There haven't been a lot of estimates for countries, but also appear to be a bit lower. We certainly have much starker uh, gaps between majority and minority groups in this country uh, than in other countries. So I definitely think there's a reason that this is front and center um, on the policy agenda.